you know, certain points through this conversation, I'm going to start feeling anxious and start getting in my own head. And you won't be able to really tell, but I kind of, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I just, um, I zone out. I don't know what it is, but so if that happens, I'm sorry. I don't. Yeah, zones out. Mm. When he's with me. He just mentions it. Oh, for some reason or another, I'm zoning out right now. We might look at what we were just talking about as the trigger. It's like you were talking about, you're watching TV, you've had a good day, you're sitting there, what? Suddenly you start feeling anxious. No cause and effect, right? You can't identify, oh, that was the cause, this is the result. That's what's scary about anxiety. If there's a tiger standing, standing there, you'd say, I know what I'm afraid of. There's no tiger there. Tiger's inside. Yeah. Mm. What is anxiety in your words? What would you... I'll tell you what it, they are, what it is in Freud's words. You know who Freud is, yeah? Yes. He s called it signal anxiety. And I, I, when I read that, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And the way I started hearing it was sort of like, there's an alarm going off. That's a signal. You don't know if it's somebody's breaking into your house. You don't know if it's a fire. You just, if there's a flood in the basement. You don't know what it is. You just know that you should be become alert. So I think something in your unconscious knows that something, you just had a thought, or there was just an image on the screen that touch something in your unconscious, something that troubles troubles you, but you didn't make the connection in your conscious mind. So now suddenly you're getting this signal anxiety. Mm -hmm. Pay attention, that's what the anxiety is saying. Pay attention, you're not paying attention to something that's really important here. That's the way I understand it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it could be anything I'm watching on TV, an infomercial or commercial or uh, uh, an ad on cell phone plans, anything. Yeah. Because that's that's what it is. Sometimes I'm watching something very random and it's not something where, you know, it's a scene that brings back memories of a sad moment or a movie that, you know, brings back bad memories. It's just a random anything, just a random commercial. And that sometimes, yeah, it just brings me back. It gives me that anxiety, that little fire that little tingliness and for me it's my chest gets tight and my heart beat starts beating fast and but what you're saying is that commercial or whatever i'm seeing that's completely irrelevant is actually triggering something in my yeah. subconscious that yeah i'll give you an example so this guy is walking towards to see his therapist and he starts having a panic attack and he doesn't know why he gets to the therapist and he tells the therapist he's got a panic attack happening. And then they go into it and then he realizes that as he was walking towards the therapist's office, he saw a billboard advertising floor scrapings. <clears throat> and his uh, girlfriend just had an abortion, which is a floor scraping of the vagina to get the fetus out. So he wasn't aware, you know, he just saw a billboard saying fluorscaping, didn't pay any attention to it, but it got into him. Mm. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Right, yeah. yeah. That, that kind of thing. So there's always something there. You may be able to grab it if you're, if you're confident enough or courageous enough to relax into the anxiety. You might be able to grab it or you might not. It might disappear and it'll come up three weeks later. Mm. Yeah. How do you relax into the anxiety? Because I know what you mean, but it's way easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly if there's a lot of people around, it's pretty hard to do. I mean, like you said, you might have some anxiety during this interview and I won't be able to tell. So, you know, most people are good at faking it. They just endure until the moment's passed and they're out of there. But if, if you're alone, I think you can just sort of drop into it. You sort of drop into your body and you adopt an attitude of it. I accept this. 
and then and I'm not going to fight it. Mm. I'm going to accept it. Now, this also works with pain. If I'm in a lot of pain, and I'm, I'm going to have some knee operations coming up, if I try to fight the pain, the pain is worse. If I s accept the pain, it goes down, which is counterintuitive. You wouldn't ex think, no, I've got to make myself strong. I've got to fight this. But in the fighting, the anxiety goes up. The pain goes up. And in the accepting, it goes down. It doesn't go away, but it goes down. And you have that sense of control. Oh, I have more control here than I thought I did. Yeah. How do you learn to accept it, though? Because I've tried doing that. And I, you know, I, every day when I do feel anxiety, I tell myself to start accepting it, just to sit with it, to be completely fine with it. But it's scary. For me, it's very, very scary having anxiety and being able to sit with it. Is it maybe partly because I'm at times not completely comfortable with who I am, with who Mo is, and therefore sitting with myself is already not the safest place to be because I'm already, I, I have issues of being comfortable with uncomfortable with myself at times. So when the anxiety comes and I need to get back within myself and and show myself love and care and be in my own body, I can't do that because I already have an issue with being with myself when the anxiety isn't even there. So when now it's there, it's like a, it's a it's a double yeah. thing happening. Yeah. Let's make it a triple thing. So the triple thing would be this. So here's an example. A guy has a meeting to go to. He hasn't uh, read the minutes from the last meeting, so he's reading them. He takes the stairs instead of the elevator. So he's reading the minutes as he goes up the stairs to the meeting. He gets to the meeting. His heart's beating really fast, of course, because he just climbed you know, two flights of stairs. He says, am I having a heart attack? That is... His, his body's producing unusual symptoms. His mind is interpreting that and saying, am I having a heart attack? The thought, am I having a heart attack, makes the heart beat faster. We get a feedback loop, like holding a microphone up to a speaker. Mm. It starts to accelerate. So the way out of that is to get out of your head, because I imagine when you get scared, you're telling yourself, okay, this time is it. I'm going to go crazy this time. Some, You have some catastrophic thought, and that thought feeds back into your body, and, of course, your body starts to vibrate. And so the way out of that is to go completely into your body and leave your mind, leave your mind aside. What I mean by leaving your mind aside is leaving those thoughts aside. So all you're aware of, is your breath going in, your breath going out? Mm. And you disconnect. Now, I, I had one client who's autistic. He's, he's a genius. He knows all about film and stuff like that. I, I asked him, well, what's it like for you when you're in a panic attack situation? And he says, I make my body go limp. He found a way to space out, to zone out. So he got away from his anxiety that way. I get away from anxiety by going into my body, by going into my breath. But I've practiced that, so I'm good at it. You know, when the first time you try it, mm. it's probably not going to work. Mm. So you just, it's just like practicing lacrosse or golf or guitar. Or you just practice, 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 and then it's there for you. It's a tool. Mm. Yeah. For someone that has the symptom of maybe increased heart rate and tightness in chest, you're saying, you know, going going into the body, focusing on your breath. In that moment, the breath is pretty hard to focus on because, and this is personally for me, I try to do that. I try to go back into my own body and sit with myself and focus on my breath. But my breath is already so irregular from all the anxiety and the worry happening in that moment that it 
makes it even worse because I'm I'm trying to focus on the breath and my body and within me, but I'm not able to. So then it's a perpetual cycle of, oh my God, I can't even do that. I can't even sit with myself and focus on my breath without feeling as if I want to die or my I'm about to lose my mind. I completely understand that. I I relate to that sometimes because I have been able to sit with myself, but in the majority of times, I'm not able to because one of the main symptoms I am going through is a shortness of breath. I mean, is there any way is maybe start pinching myself or put my hand in cold water or any <laughs> because the breath for me is a tough place to go to because my anxiety symptoms is dominantly shortness of breath right. heart rate irregular heartbeat i can i can literally feel my heartbeat beating putting your hand in cold water is not a bad idea splashing your face with cold water not a bad idea in the old movies the old black and white movies woman's going hysterical her husband slaps her and she says thank you what's going on there when he slaps her she her mind instantly goes to the stinging sensation in her face she leaves her thoughts she goes right to her body so there's a a guru or a shaman you know what a shaman is yeah yeah so there's a shaman down in Mexico and this anthropology student goes down to work with him and see what the shaman can teach him. The shaman's giving him some drugs, mescaline, psilocybin, various drugs. And the guy starts freaking out. The student starts freaking out. So what his shaman does is he reaches over with his knuckle and hits him on the top of the head, really sharp. Same as the slap in the movie. The, the knock on the top of the head brings you back to your body very quickly. Same with the splash in the cold water. But this one works the best. Mm. So it's like an emergency uh, thing. Mm. For me, the breath thing, I, I don't need to do that because I've, I've, I've practiced the breath thing enough so now I know how to do that. Yeah, mm. Which makes a lot of sense because I remember um, during the time I was very anxious, I... Uh, I, I sprained my ankle and um, the pain I was feeling in my ankle actually brought me more peace because I was focused everything. I focused everything onto my, onto my ankle. And, and, exactly. I was, and I was wondering, what, why is this happening? I should be more anxious, if anything, because I've you know, hurt myself. I, I'm inactive. I, I can't really play basketball anymore for a few weeks, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm in pain, but... Surprisingly, it, it, be, it may be more peaceful, it may be more calm. So I, that makes a lot of sense. And one thing I'm very interested in, I was thinking of this when I was driving here, you said that you've been, you've been a therapist, you've been working with people for over 50 years. Yeah. What are some differences and some changes you've seen throughout your time as a therapist? What are, are people still anxious and depressed over the same things as they were maybe 30 or 40 years ago or has it been changing i don't think so i think life is much more complicated now than it was 30 40 years ago so i think there's always sort of like background anxiety in the whole culture nobody knows where the culture is going right now so everybody's just sort of doing the best they can you know we just went through covid i mean that was strange it's a very strange time. Everybody tried to act normal. Meanwhile, they're anxious, they're uncertain. They don't have much certainty. So it doesn't take much, you know, the anxiety level is already up here and then something else happens. You get fired from your job or your girlfriend breaks up with you or whatever. So last, then all of a sudden now you're into a panic attack because you're already building on this background anxiety that everybody's experiencing. Mm. Right? So I think there's a lot of that going on mm. right now. And so what are some of the similarities you've seen throughout your career and your time as a therapist 
from 30, 40 years ago till now, is there one, is there a few certain things that are pretty much fundamental in everyone's yeah. mental health and depression? Yeah. The big thing is everybody has installed in their mind some sort of, um, do you ever go to the gym and you watch those personal coaches screaming at their clients? Yeah. Everybody's got one of those in their head. It's just giving them shit, giving them cr criticizing them, saying, what a stupid thing, why did you just say that, you, uh, you jerk? <laughs> Everybody's got one of those in their head. And it's sort of like the personal coach. It's sort of say, well, unless I'm mean to you, you won't improve. I've got to give you shit for, your, for you to improve. But when they listen to that voice, they get smaller. They don't get bigger. Right. You know, if your dad's bawling you out, what are you going to do? You're going to get smaller. You're, you're humbling yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the same when that voice inside your head is criticizing you're going to get smaller. Mm. And, and in any generation it, now or 30, 40 years ago, that's been a pretty constant thing with everybody. Always, always there. Yeah. Are more people becoming depressed now than they were? I had a bunch of stats, but I can't remember them. But mm. Suicide rates going up, depression rates going up, anxiety rates are going up. Yeah. What do you think that one of the biggest reasons is? I mean, there's tons of reasons, obviously, I, and we don't know all the answers, and there, we could bring up a million different stats, but what's, what's one of the biggest things you've seen working with clients and seeing different people throughout so many years? And I think that uh, most people avoid going to therapy until their relationship breaks down, either their relationship with their partner or their relationship to their child, then they're in a lot of pain and they'll, they pay to get out of that pain. Uh, not as many people come because they're having anxiety attacks. It's more around relationship. And they might have panic attacks around their relationship, but they, their primary focus is their relationship. Yeah. There's a couple of things I want to say from earlier in our conversation, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the earthquake thing, Mo, that was amazing to me. And what came up for me as I listened to you is I remember a long time ago, I used to have these dreams about being in a high rise and an earthquake was happening and that high rise was starting to go like that, mm. swaying back and forth. Those dreams stopped, thank God. I also had this very powerful experience down in the West Indies and uh, I was reading mystical literature and uh, it was getting to me, the mystical literature was getting to me and I was riding these big waves when I wasn't reading. I was swimming, body surfing. And so whenever I was in trouble mentally, I would have dreams of big waves. So earthquakes and tsunamis and that became my yardstick in which I would measure my mental health. You know, so those waves would take me out to sea, and I'd be lost. Then I'd be in a rowboat, and the rowboat would be taken out to sea. Then I'd be in a cruise ship, and the cruise ship was steady. Then I'd be on the land, and the wave would be coming towards me, but it wouldn't reach me. Mm -hmm. And so there was... They were my indicators that I was getting more solid. Basically all the metaphors for being That's right. anxious and unstable. Both, and Yeah, both the metaphors, exactly. Both the high rises swaying and the waves were metaphors for my own wobbling, my own swaying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what you're saying is when I had those fears as a child of having these earthquakes happening at any moment, that was it actually made more sense than I thought it did. It was literally a metaphor for shakiness and, and collapse and, and destruction and unstable and, and unpredictability. That's good, Mo. It's interesting, I've been talking to men lately who told me that when they were about seven or eight, they suddenly realized they were gonna die. Sooner or later, they were gonna die. It was a uh, reality. It wasn't just an abstract idea. You, you know what I mean, the difference? Mm. Like somebody wrote a book called Nobody's Sane at 3 o'clock in the morning. So you can have a, a thought at 10 o'clock in the morning, no problem. Same thought at 3 o'clock in the morning, 
your chest gets tight. It, it's a reality for you. Your defenses aren't working at three o'clock in the morning. They're working at 10 o'clock in the morning, but not three o'clock in the morning. You mm -hmm. follow what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these boys were getting this huge hit of mortality. I'm going to die. What the hell? What is this? Game? That early? Seven or eight years old? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So uh, the two guys that I was thinking, one was a philosophy professor, and I think that started him on that path. And, and the same with I thought that, that started him on a path of like, what is life? How does this work? What's my place in it? You know, when you have those kind of shocking experiences, you, you can't rest until you get to the bottom of it. You want to you understand what the hell is going on. And do you think it's it's better and more liberating for someone to just accept that you're never going to find out what life is for or is there is there an end point is there a way to practice and try to get a grip on where everything is going and kind of give yourself a sense of purpose because i think as i'm getting older i'm 27 now in the past few years i would say since 24 25 i am getting to the point where i am questioning what is really the point of living i'm not i'm not saying i'm suicidal I, I i love life i love the little things that make me happy that bring me joy and excitement but i guess i'm the playful child from when i was in high school is gone even early 20s i would say 2021 i still had pretty much no idea i was very oblivious and naive to things and I wish I was still like that, where I wasn't so focused on the process of life and the process of understanding everything. Because back then I was very playful and courageous. I am courageous still now, but I'm back then I just didn't have any fears of anything. But as more and more I'm getting older i'm starting to become more conscious of what's going on and i thought it would be the exact opposite when i was growing up i thought when i was 16 or 17 that when i got to 30 i'd be completely fearless completely just you know not worried about other people's opinions and the externals and everything that's going on but it's becoming the opposite almost and now i have to really put in the practice of being with myself mm-hmm yeah. I mean, if that makes sense, I don't know. It made, it's, uh, it made total sense. You know, I think you're describing a lot of people's experience, including my own. So here's what I mean by that. I was 18 until I turned 27. Maturationally, when I turned 19, I had the same idea of who I was and the way the world worked as I had at 18. Same at 20. Same. Nothing changed. This is the way life is. 27, I had nine years of maturation in one year. As I realized, oh my God, this is far, far, far more complicated than I thought it was. I grew up. Yeah. It sounds like... Isn't that bad? I wish, I wish we never grew up. I wish we always stayed in that 18 or 19-year-old mindset because it was so free and so... So uh, there's no worries. Yeah. But do you think... Are you happy? Are you... Do you think it's a good thing to have that nine year maturation all of a sudden? Is it? No, it was. <laughs> I think it was a good thing, but I think it was very, very difficult to, to navigate through that. Yeah. You're touching on so many things. My mind is racing with all the possibilities. Yeah. I mean, go for it. I, I want to give you the stage to. Yeah. Well, say, I, I want to go back to the earthquake thing. This guy says, a paranoid person has lost the ability to make a distinction between possibility and probability. So we could arrange things like this. Yeah, that's possible. That's probable. That actually will happen. We're going from imaginary to reality along that continuum, right? It is possible that the Portman Bridge will collapse when I drive home after this interview. It's not probable. At a certain point, you can lose that distinction. If I think it, therefore it's possible. Therefore it's probable. 
I thought that was interesting. So when you're solid, when you've you know developed kind of solidity with yourself, you keep that distinction. No, that's ridiculous. That that would never happen. You know that. You don't have to convince yourself. You have that confidence, right? Mm. But then, you know, when you get paranoid and you get anxiety, all your certain truths, all the truths that you thought were solid, they're dissolving or they're moving around. And that's when you start losing those distinctions. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what what causes someone to lose that distinction? I think anxiety. Uh, anxiety, somebody said, a philosopher I like a lot said, anxiety is the fluidization of everything that once was solid. So we're a little two-year-old and we, we realize, if I cry, mommy comes. If this happens, then that will happen. And then we start to put together a lot of those rules. If I throw a ball, it will bounce. We just build up those rules. Those rules become more and more solid. That's how, how they become solid until we have our first panic attack or anxiety attack. We have a model in our head about how the world works and how Mo works in that world or how Larry works in that world. It's just a model. And then when we have an anxiety attack, it's like that model is, breaks up and we don't have it anymore. And we're thrown into reality directly without the model. And that's scary. It's like landing in a strange city. You don't know the language in that city. You don't know if you drive on the right or the left. It's like that. Future shock and culture shock is like that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say anxiety always, the root of anxiety, why it comes up, why people start feeling anxiety? And to allude to the example of something triggering your subconscious and and uh, bringing that uh, symptom or that, that whatever it is into your body, would you say that anxiety makes sense? Does it always make sense? Because there are times when I'm feeling anxious and it, I, for the love of God, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to reason with it, I'm trying to be its friend and understand why it's happening, but it's so irrational that, and it couldn't, it, it doesn't make sense. And that's what scares me because I'm really trying to be like, okay, you're here, it's happening this thought that's happening in my head, this OCD, because I also deal with OCD, this OCD that's going on, there's a reason why it's happening. There's a, there's always a reason It's it's trying to be my, it's trying to help me out. It's trying to protect me. But the deeper I look, the deeper I try to reason with it, the more and more I become more confused because it doesn't make sense. And that's, that, that's when it becomes so terrifying. And that's when I'm, I feel like I'm losing my mind. Yeah. And the key word there, the key phrase is it doesn't make sense. And so who's talking there? It's your mind that's talking there. It's your mind, all our minds want to make sense. That's, that's, that's their job. Our body doesn't really care that much about making sense. So that's why I said at a certain point, when you're having an anxiety attack, stop trying to figure it out. Just go right to your body and go limp. Go limp in your body. And then you, you, it's sort of like you're unplugging from the power source. You know, when you plug your computer into a wall outlet, you're getting a power source, or, or you're getting a power surge at times, scrambling the data. You just reach over, you pull that plug out, and the plug that's plugged into your mind that's driving this whole thing, and you just go directly to your body, and you stop trying to make sense. Which is also easier said than done. You have to practice. It's a practice, yeah. yeah. All this, all these things that we're talking about, how to deal with it and how to be better with it, the person needs to put in the effort to practice, That's just right. like anything else. Yes. Well, so, so let's say you're being attacked by anxiety. You're having an anxiety, or I'm having an anxiety attack. Now, I can, I can drop into my body, as I've said a number of times today, or I can summon courage. I can say, is there any courage there in my body? It's like you're a courageous guy when you were younger. You still are, right? So I call on my courage. It's not like something that's just sitting there waiting for me. I have to call it. 
And then, oh, I can feel it coming. I get up and start doing some exercise, moving my body around, trying to get the energy mobilized. You know, getting the energy mobilized it fills, starts filling me up. Mm. While the anxiety is happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start doing push-ups, sit-ups, going for a run, mm. using the anxiety instead of putting the my foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. Mm. You, you know what I mean by that? Right. So the anxiety is beside you while you're doing all this. That's right. It's beside me. Maybe to make it cute or, you know, somewhat nice to think about, it's holding my hand. We're holding hands while we're doing this together. Yeah. Uh, another way of saying that, another metaphor is, okay, anxiety, you're the passenger. I'm the driver, okay? You can come along. But you're in the passenger seat. I'm in the driver's seat here. Mm. Yeah. That's mm. another way of looking at it. Mm. I'm very curious. In the years that you have been a therapist, what what's one thing that's changed with people's um, depression and anxiety? What's one? Is there one certain cause that you've seen change throughout time where people back? you know, back 20, 30 years ago, weren't so anxious and depressed about, but now are at the at the forefront of their anxiety and depression. Is there a thing or a couple things that are going on that weren't such a big deal back in, you know, 20, 30 years ago, yeah. but is now? I understand your question, Mo, but I don't have a very good answer for it other than and it's just speculation on my part. What I saw with COVID is that people withdrew into their homes. They stopped going out as much. And I think that was already happening before COVID. People were withdrawing into the video games, into pornography. So it's almost like you could build your own safe environment by staying home and while you're building that safe environment, you don't have, you're not learning much about social skills, how to read social cues, how to engineer a good conversation amongst a group of friends. You're, you're not learning any, any of that stuff. So then you go out into the world and you feel awkward and uh, embarrassed. And so you say, nah, you know, I'm better off at home. Mm. Just continue watch playing video games and watching porn and things like that. So I think something like that's going on. Mm. So that people, when they venture out into the world, and they're, we're, we're lonely. People are lonely. They want to have that connection with other people, with a girlfriend or a partner, or a group of friends. And they get, so that pulls them out of their house, and they get out there and they don't know how to do it. And it goes sideways, it goes south, it, they break up. They don't understand why they're breaking up. Back to the video game. Hmm. I think something like that might be going on. You said that this was happening even before COVID. Yeah. That's interesting. So what was what was making that happen? What do you why do you think there's there were more people looking to be inside and becoming more antisocial even before COVID? Is there a reason? Do you know? You, you you talk, when you and I talked on the phone, you talked about social media. And you please correct me if I, because I'm old and I don't, I'm not living in that world. But it seems to me that social media, everybody's life look, should look like a beer commercial. I've got 5,000 friends. <laughs> I've got beautiful girlfriends. I've got a lovely car, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. Yeah. Suffocating, really. Yeah. So you meet somebody and you cannot possibly live up to the image that you portrayed of yourself in Facebook. Now there comes the person that you're dating, live up to their image. So the whole thing is fraught with a lot of anxiety right from the get-go. What I tell people, what I tell my clients is, what are you interested in? They'll say photography. I said, take a night school course in photography. You'll meet people that are also interested in photography and they won't be looking at you like you're, you're their date. They'll be able to relax and enjoy you, and you'll be able to enjoy them. And something can grow naturally from that contact. Mm. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? 
Right. Are you are you basically alluding to the fact that social media is creating a skewed idea of how people should be meeting each other and what having a relationship really means and what the root of it you know constitutes and i believe i agree with you social media is an absolute cancer to society i i remember the time before social media and it was the one of the most peaceful times i've ever had growing up and ever since then it's just been this suffocating thing that just drains the soul out of people and so you would you would say that's the biggest component yeah. that has to be it yeah yeah mm. mediated everything is mediated video games are mediated porn's mediated social media is mediated you're not dealing with actual people real people mm. you're not getting any training in that are you fearful for the next generation of yes. kids? Yes. I look at my daughter. She's got two kids, a nine-year-old boy, a six-year-old girl, and I think that's optimism. And when I look at buildings being built downtown Vancouver, I think that's optimism. So I look around for people that are forging ahead, believing that our world is going to, we can make a better world than what, what we're doing right now. In, in some ways, you know, I think the time that we're living through right now is called the lim. You can call it the liminal zone. You know what liminal? No. Liminal is, it's between two fixed forms. So, say in a First Nations community, when a boy turns thirteen, they send him out into the woods for three days with no companions, and in those three days, he's in the liminal zone, and he has to survive. When he comes out, he's an adult. He finds something out there in the woods. He finds an eagle. He finds a, a cougar. He finds some animal that he takes into himself in order to be a man. Yeah. Mm. So I'd say our whole culture is going through a shift from a certain way of being, a modern way of being, to a postmodern way of being. And nobody knows how that's going to play out. So the rules... The rules in which we engage with each other are all morphine. None of yeah, none of it makes sense. There's so many different. There's not one. We don't have any identity anymore as a society, as a culture. What, what are we? What is one mutual thing that we all stand for? We, I I don't know. Yeah, it's very scary. Yeah, well, you you said something earlier that was sort of touches on this. You said, "What's the point? What's the point of all this?" Right? Where's this all going? Yeah. That's another way of talking about it. It's hard to know what the point is right now because it's shifting. The landscape is all shifting right now, and we're not sure how we're going to come out of it. It can create uh, sparks of genius, you know, when, when the times are as unstable as they are right now. That's when you throw up a Leonardo da Vinci. That's when you throw up a Bob Dylan. That's when you throw up Marx or Darwin, you know, some somebody who does make sense for the next generation comes along. Mm. Yeah. Personally, I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic that that will happen anytime soon because it's becoming more and more, I just feel like people are becoming more brainwashed and watered down and I have to watch out for myself and the people around me to keep them in check. And How do you mean keep them in check? can't speak on other people actually but for myself i think simply getting off my phone and being in the physical real world and being f in my physical self because there are times when i'm on my phone for a long period of time where i'm engulfed in something external where i completely lose myself completely dissociate from my physical self and that's that's a big part of when my anxiety really kicks in where I feel like I am being thrown around in the wind. I'm in I'm in midair and I have no grounding and I'm just being tossed around by where the the wind is taking me. I have no say or whatever in how I want to feel, how I want to think, but I'm just going with however whatever the world is 
whatever direction the world is making me go. Yeah, that's really good. That's a very good description. And it's terrifying. It's absolutely just debilitating at times. Yeah, well, it's sort of like you give yourself away. You go on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and your attention is drawn into that. It's drawn away from your core. It's drawn away from your soul. It's drawn towards these passing images and you're just tossed around by these passing images but there's no ballast in the boat anymore you know what a ballast is no in a sailboat they've got a deep deep keel it's full of lead okay so that the sailboat doesn't tip over when a strong wind comes up because there's lots of ballast that's holding it down and when you're on social media all the time you're losing all your ballast you're losing your physical connection Mm. to the physical world yeah right yeah was there something similar to social media before social media became a thing from the times that you've worked with different people and in the past was there something as intoxicating as social media i remember email people saying i don't send the emails because they're so easy to misinterpret and that was an occasional complaint that I would hear, but nothing like what I hear about social media. Mm. Yeah. You think? Do you think in the history of human society there has been anything as toxic as social media? Some of the religions seem pretty toxic. Mm. Yeah, the Crusades going on and slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people in the name of Christianity is. Not so good. Communism, same thing. They were slaughtering people in the Ukraine, starving people to death. So those things are a little bit worse, maybe, than social media. But to even be mentioned in the same words, as, in the same sentence as just murder and homicide and destruction is just, it makes you, it makes you realize how terrible social media is to be mentioned in tragedies and Yeah, like the Holocaust or, yeah. Two things I want to say. When you were afraid of going to sleep when you were a little boy, I also was afraid of going to sleep when I was a little boy. My mother would tell me I would fight it. I'd be in that high chair fighting it off, fighting it off. Lately I've been reading that we come from being. Mo, you came from being. Larry came from being. Alice came from being. And out of that being, we form a Mo, or we form a Larry, or we form an Alex. Mm -hmm. But it's tenuous at first. It's not very solid, and we're always afraid. If I fall asleep, I'll lose myself. I'll go back into being again. I won't be here anymore. Wow, yeah. That made huge sense to me, yeah. Wow, I I never thought of it like that. It's interesting, isn't it? It makes me feel better because it, I, it gives some sense and some justification of why I felt like that before. Yes, and I think that's ongoing. You know, like to later in life when you get an anxiety attack, it's the same as, I don't want to fall asleep, I don't want to fall asleep because I won't be existent then. I'll be non-existent when I fall asleep. Wow. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is you can get caught in this loop in your head. Uh, say the persecutor voice is saying, you're stupid, Why did you say that? That was dumb. That voice is going over and over in your head and you can't get away from it. The way you get away from it is you say out loud what your body is doing. So, for example, right now, Larry's looking at his hand. Oh, now Larry's looking at Mo. Now he's turning his head and looking at Alex. If I do that, I start laughing spontaneously. It's sort of like it breaks the spell of being trapped inside your head. It works. Mm. You, you you escape that escape. person right. in your head. You just, you know, just yeah. connect with your body. So you connect language that's coming out of your mouth to describe your behavior in the world. That's very profound. I'm going to practice this for sure. I'm going to listen to this again. And one thing before I let you go, I really want to quickly touch on this. I, the one clip I saw Aaron post uh, was you mentioned that women are 12 steps ahead of men relationally. And uh, because of that, men and women are having 
tough times with their relationships less people are having sex can you can you explain that a little bit more because i'll try because okay. it's a mystery that i'm trying to solve as well you know and in conversations like you and i are having and that alex would be interested in being part of uh we start to put our thoughts together your thoughts with my thoughts with alex's thoughts and we start to unravel some of the mysteries that you're asking about. So here's my provisional answer, my tentative answer. It's, I think that women are born into dependency. They know what dependency is about. That is, when you're carrying a baby in you, you know that that baby is dependent on you, and you know that you and the baby are like this one creature, and you surrender to it. You accept it. Men don't have that experience. And men, we men are told, be independent. Don't be pathetic and weak. That kind of stuff, right? So men pretend to themselves that they are autonomous. They're free agents. Well, I'll make one exception. Uh, I, I'm going to be dependent on my wife or my girlfriend or my boyfriend or whatever. All right. We'll put all our dependency onto that one person, and it's too much. That person can't bear it. They've got their own life to live. And then, mm. then this man is saying, you're going out again tonight? How come you don't want to be with me? Uh, and, and then the fight starts. Wow, okay. Yeah. So inherently men being like that is, it, for men for a man to be like that is because it's an inherent thing of, who they are, what they're made of. And women, because they have that maternal instinct, essentially. See, the highest value for women that I can see is relationship. That's their highest value. The highest value for men is autonomy, freedom. I'm in charge of my life. I'm in control. That's the man's value. The woman's value is I relate to my kids, I relate to my husband, I relate to my parents, I relate to my girlfriends. Relate, relate, relate. Yeah. Mm. There's there's exceptions to that. There are some men that are very relational. Mm. Yeah. But I would say as a whole, women are more relational than men are. Are you saying it as well that men wanting to be autonomous and being independent are not actually as independent as they think they are? For sure. That's exactly what I'm saying. And they're gobsmacked when they find out they're actually dependent. All along, I thought I was independent. And all of a sudden, I'm falling apart because my girlfriend doesn't want to spend the night with me. What the hell? Mm. I'm more dependent than I thought. Or there's something wrong with her. That's mm. the first move. There's something wrong with her. I'll just get rid of her and I'll get a proper girlfriend. Mm. <laughs> oh, she's saying the same thing my last girlfriend said. I'll get rid of her too. Third one, same thing. Oh, I think I'm gonna have to change. Yeah. And they start questioning their own manlyhood of why am I so dependent on this one person? Why am I wondering why they keep going out every night? What's going on? Where are you? What's happening? Are you coming home? Yeah, you got it. So then they have to learn how to manage their own dependency, how to get to know it, how to work with it. Mm -hmm. Same as the anxiety thing. Okay, I am dependent. How does this work? When does it get activated? How do I handle it when it gets activated? You know, you just practice, practice, practice. That's a lot of interesting stuff. I, I'm i very surprised at the things that, and I'm, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. That's yeah. one thing. I've actually learned a lot from this, and I'm, I'm going to listen to this over and over again. Did you get engaged? With yes, we I, was, I was engaged the whole time. Yeah. At no point did I zone out or good start feeling anxious and good. that's what i wanted i wanted you to i didn't want you to have to feel anxious and i think when men get together and have a real conversation like this all parties leave bigger than they when, when they entered it i'm bigger now because of the way we've talked i think you're bigger i suspect alex is bigger as well mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah i think this has been really good and I, I would love to have you back on again at some point because this was really good and 
when you watch it over and over again, just start making a few notes. I, I wish we had gone further with this. So then when we get back together again, we don't reinvent the wheel. We build yes. on what we've already started. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I'm going to take some notes. And there is going to be a part two for sure. And I want to thank, thank you for coming on. Okay. This this means a lot. I I, I love these type, type of thought, talks and these these talks need to be happening. Well, thank more. you for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was Enjoy Your 24, episode 45 with Dr. Larry Green, uh, therapist, mental health professional uh, for a very long time. And uh, it's been, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to have you on. Thank you again for coming on. And thank you to Aaron for connecting us. This has been awesome. And for people watching, people listening, if you liked anything from this podcast, from this episode, please like, subscribe, share, comment, uh, do whatever you need to. We appreciate the support um, as well and all the support we have been getting this this whole time. And uh, thank you again to everyone. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Enjoy your time of work. Peace.